Good day. We are going to talk about plant competition. There are, this is the plan of the competition section of the lecture. Uh, it will be over three weeks. So today we're going to see the introductory part. What is the competition? How do we measure it? And how do we characterize it? Interspecific, intraspecific, exploitative, interference, and so on. Next week, you are going to do competition models. Don't worry, I will tell you everything. I have made everything in a way that you can study this whenever you feel comfortable, because I know when you are uh, going through new materials, sometimes you're not concentrated in classes and then you're like, oh my God, oh my God, I didn't understand this. So instead of you coming here, I will give you and listening to me talking, I have made a playlist on YouTube that is the, the whole lecture. It's short videos, so every of the models has its own video. Uh, so you can listen to them, you can learn at your own pace, and when you come next week, we will do some exercises. And that way, I hope it will be more efficient for you to, to do the competition models. You will see it's very simple. Uh, and last week, we are going to talk about the evolutionary and ecological aspects of competition. So the consequences for the coexistence of the species, the consequences uh, that lead to a different ecological strategy and how they assemble in community, and how competition affects plant diversity in general. Uh, this looks like a very long list of reading material, but actually it is not. I will put the PDFs of all of these chapters in the Microsoft Teams group. This is one chapter from a book called Plant Ecology that is a little bit older edition, but it is very well written. I like it very much. These here are sub-chapters of another book about competition in general, so animals and plants and other types of organisms. And these here, 2.1, 6.6 is just two pages. So there is a lot in the list, but it is not very, very short, very short, uh, very long reading, sorry. Uh, and this is yet another good book for plant evolutionary ecology, where I also have a few things for you to read. Um, this lecture is going to be recorded and available online. If the lecture is enough for you, you don't have to read any of this. If you want more details, if you want to see where do I get my inspiration from, it's from here. Okay, so uh, let's start with a question. Centaurium erythrae, it's a plant that I'm currently growing in the botanical garden for an experiment. I told you about this last week. Um, and because it is a new experiment and I have never worked with this plant, I tried to test different germination conditions. Uh, now, the problem is that the seeds of this plant are really, really, really small and they're very difficult to manipulate. So I wanted to take one pot, like a one, one pot of one liter, and put maybe 50, like between 20 and 50 seeds in there. And instead I put about 150, maybe, well, I say 250 here. So just too many. And this is what I get. So there are plenty of small seedlings. Like each pair of leaves here corresponds to a teeny tiny plant and they have all germinated in the same pot. Now, without anything else, just looking at this, can you tell me if this is proof of competition? It's a yes or no question. Yes. Yes? Why? Because the, uh, only the strongest uh, plants can grow big. Mm -hmm. But how do we know that the strongest plants will grow big? can see. <laughs> <laughs> it is true that some of the plants are bigger than others. Um, that is a very relevant observation. Some, some, some ecologists, myself included, would argue that the plants that are growing closer to the edge of the pot, that they only have competition on one side, they have grown a little bit bigger. But uh, it's kind of debatable. It can be other reasons as well. Maybe the plants growing on this side have more direct sunlight. <laughs> So they also grow, uh, or, or the pot is warmer, so they also grow bigger. So actually, 
uh, at this stage, with only this information, I wouldn't say that this is proof of competition. There can be competition, but we don't have the proof for it. Uh, and th these are the options. Why this is not sufficient proof for competition? Do we know? No, why? Well, actually, this is a question for you. So you can read the options and maybe tell me if there is one that looks more reasonable than the others. Only one of them is true. Well, plants are of the same species. It's not the reason yes. um, why it couldn't be competition. Yes, because we, we have seen that we can have intraspecific interactions and competition is typically can be an intraspecific interaction. It can also be interspecific, but this is definitely not a good explanation of why our current experimental design is not good for showing competition. Any other? The last one. What do we do with the last one? It's not true. It, yeah, yeah, okay. So all plants grow the same, none is outcompeting the others. We already said that some of the seedlings are growing bigger than the others. But even if they weren't, it, there can be intensive competition that is symmetrical. So both organisms or all of these organisms here have exactly the same effect on one another and they all are of, of reduced growth. So re only reduced growth per se doesn't say anything. These can be simply be very small seedlings. Even if we take them apart and we grow each of them individually, maybe they will all be of the same size. So that leaves us two options. Okay, I'll give you the answer. This is what I was looking for. You cannot say that there is competition here because you don't know what happens when the plants are not growing together. So in order to make an experiment where you can show the existence of competition, you need to compare the growth of the seedlings, all of them together when they're supposedly competing and the seedlings by themselves. And because this was an experiment where I was testing different germination conditions for Centaurium erythrae, I also have pots where the plants are growing individually. And you can see that there is clearly a different, even the largest plants here are not as big as the ones growing all by themselves. So based on this, here are two definitions about competition from the books that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture. Competition can be considered either the negative effects that one organism has upon another by consuming, controlling access to a resource that is limited in availability. So Kerry talks about negative effects in general. They don't say what is the negative, whether it is the growth of the plant, whether it is the, the foraging behavior and so on. And then you have Crowley, whose definition is a little bit more specific saying how the ability of an individual of one species to inhibit the survival and growth of individuals of another species is called interspecific competition. But this can also happen in intraspecific competition. So very important is that Kelly is talking about negative effects that are due to resource consumption. So according to Kelly, for competition to occur, you must have two individuals that share a resource, these blue dots here, we can say that there are nutrients in the soil, which are limited. So there is not enough for everybody. And one of the, of the individuals is capable of better exploiting this resource, of absorbing more nutrients, maybe because it is genetically programmed so that it has higher roots. In this case, this individual is going to use most of the resource in the soil, which will favor its growth, whereas the other individual will not have access to the same resource anymore because of the competition. So this is a good definition when it comes to a type of competition called exploitative, when there is competition for resources, but it doesn't include interference competition, where there is no competition for resources, but other types of negative interactions. We will see both of them later on in the lecture. So how do we measure competition? In order to have an experimental design that reliably proves the existence of competition, you need to have comparison of the performance of plants grow without competition and with competition. Now, performance of plants can be any kind of trait 
that tells you how good is the plant or how bad is the plant in given environments. So it can be the biomass, the production of seeds, the production of flowers, the survival of the plants. So all of these are traits related to fitness. And then we measure the plants grown with competition, without competition, and if we have a difference between the two treatments that shows how plants growing without competition are more performant than plants growing with competition, we can assume there is competition. There is negative interactions among these plants that are closely together and all kind of competing for their resources. Questions about this? Okay, so I have a question for you. What if we have the same experimental design but the plants growing without competition are smaller than the plants growing with competition. Well, it's kind of cooperation. Yes, it's called facilitation. But yes, exactly. When, so with the same type of experimental design, you can either prove the existence of competition or of cooperation among plants, which can be called facilitation. So here is a historical example, very nicely done example about how we measure competition. This here is a Graminaceae plant. A, I don't know its Latin name, it's called blue grass. Yes, blue grass that grows in the United States that is used as foraging um, food for, um, for cattle, for cows and all other grazing animals. So this is an experiment that was done somewhere in the 1980s. They went into prairie fields where this blue grass is growing and they made three experimental treatments in the nature. So one was no competition, where the researchers removed all vegetation except for the blue grass. Then there was a competition below ground and above ground, where they didn't change anything. So the blue grass, which is in blue here, is competing with all other grasses that grow in the same field, underground with the roots and above ground with the green parts. And then they made this treatment called root competition, where they didn't change anything underground because that's quite complicated to do, but they literally took the other grasses and tied them together so that they don't cast the shadows on the blue grass. So there was competition underground at the level of the roots, but there was no competition above ground for the sunlight, for example. And here are the results. So the average, oh, I forgot to put the unit here, but the average biomass per plant is eight units when they grow without competition. And with competition, it is very, very small. It is almost eight times slower, smaller when plants are growing with competition, whether it is root competition only or root and shoot competition combined together. So here we have the typical experimental design, as I said previously, where we compare the, the performance of individuals without competition and with competition, and we see how when individuals are densely crowded together, this has negative effect on their performance. So why did they bother to do two experimental treatments of competition? Because they wanted to test whether competition is stronger above ground, or below ground, whether it exists above ground and below ground, or whether it is just on one level. So based on these results, can you tell me if the competition is mostly above ground, below ground, both, or we simply don't have enough information to make this conclusion? Both. I would say impossible to tell. Mm -hmm. I would argue that it is very probable that competition is actually below ground. Because when it's only competition at the roots, this has a highly negative effect on the plants. If you add competition between the roots and the shoots, I mean, there is a slight difference, but this is not statistically significant. So in this case, it doesn't matter whether the plants are competing, whether there is some interaction above ground, what really reduces the biomass is what happens below ground. And now, very important thing that I didn't mention before is that this was made in unfertilized soil. So the soil was as it is in the natural grassland. They didn't add, they didn't remove anything from it. And this is very important because afterwards, 
after they have reached the conclusion that competition is mostly below ground, so probably for nutrients or maybe water or something like that, they repeated the experiment, but this time they added fertilizer in the soil. And here are the results. So plants growing without competition still grow very big. Plants that are competing only at the level of the roots, so for what happens above ground, for fertilizers have reduced performance. But plants that have competitions above ground and below ground have even smaller growth. So in this case, when we removed the limitation of nutrients in the soil for which the plants were highly competing here, we have a slightly different result. So what, what happens here? Which of these statements is true? Is competition just randomly influenced by different factors? Like if you add fertilizer, it will change the results of the experiment, but we don't know how. Uh, does adding fertilizer removes competition? Or do plants compete for the most limited resource? Plants are competing for the most limited resource? Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with that one. So competition randomly influenced by different factors, we will see that this is not the case. There is a logic in all this. And adding fertilizer does not remove competition because we still see that there is competition even when the plants are only competing below ground for the nutrients, but even more so when they're competing above ground. Um, yeah, this is the correct answer. So, when the soil is not fertilized, this means that competition is very high for nutrients in the soil because this is the limiting resource. Remember, competition is defined as negative interaction for the consumption of two resources. So the competition occurs below ground on the level of the roots because everybody is trying to get as many nutrients as possible because this is limiting. And what happens above ground is really not important because there is only one factor limiting the growth of the plant, and this is the nutrients in the soil. On the other hand, if you add fertilizer to the soil, nutrients do not, are no longer the limiting factor for the competition. So we still have some root competition, probably because they didn't add too much fertilizer, but we see that now the competition above ground, probably for sunlight, is also becoming important. So when the soil is fertilized, it's no longer the nutrients that are the limiting factor for the plant growth, but it is the sunlight. So that is one very important conclusion. When you're studying competition, it is not enough to just show that density has an effect on plant growth. Ideally, you should be able to identify which is the limiting factor that causes the negative effect of density on plant growth. Like plants are growing densely, but if they're not limited in resources, they will still all grow very big. Is that clear? Okay, that's very important. So to make things even more complicated, okay, let's move on. So far we have seen that we measure competition where we have one treatment without any competition, another treatment with high plant density, and if there is a negative relationship, voila, there is competition. But actually, the relationship between plant density and competition and performance is not always linear. It can also be, come on, there you go. It can also be non-linear. So this is also important because it means that if you don't choose the right density for your experiment, you will not be able to detect competition. For instance, if you choose these two densities, the two, the, the no competition and very low density here, you see that the declining performance is just a very, very little steep line. So if your density is not high enough, you will be like, well, there is no competition, there you go. Then you can say that you can solve this problem by increasing the density to very high levels where you're sure that you're going to show competition. But this is also problematic because this portion of the curve here is something that never occurs in natural populations, for instance. So yes, indeed, if you have artificially very dense populations, you will show some effect of competition. But if this doesn't have any biological or ecological background, if this doesn't exist in the nature, what is the point of proving this? Obviously, when you put too many people crowded in one place, they will not be happy. 
but we tend not to live like 50 people in 10 square meters. So you need to carefully plan and choose the density of competition in order for your experiment to represent reality, but also to be uh, designed well enough so that you can actually detect measurable effects. So that is another problem. The third problem is that the performance of the plants depends not only on competition, which is a biotic interaction, but also on abiotic interaction in the habitats. So the curve on the top was what happens when plants are competing in a very favorable habitat, in a less favorable habitat, the curve in the middle, and in the least favorable habitat. And you can see how in the least favorable habitat, for instance, if you measure competition even at low densities, as is here, you can already see some response. So whether or not you detect competition depends on the density of your competing population, but also on the environmental conditions in which you measure it. Now, this starts to be a lot of things to be taken into account when you're testing for competition, and I'm going to add even more. Uh, another important thing is that competition can be detected or not, depending on the traits that you're measuring. I always forget the name of this one. It's a kind of a seaweed, well, it's not a seaweed, it's a sea plant that has this kind of salty iodine taste that you can eat. Um, well, there is no sea in the Czech Republic, so that's not, not really helpful. Uh, I didn't grow up next to the seaside as well, so I, I, I don't remember the name, but it is something that you can eat. And this plant here grows along the seashore from uh, incipient dunes. This is the place that is just next to the sea, so it is exposed to a lot of wind, uh, a lot of uh, salty droplets of water, which are usually not good for the development of the plant. It also grows in the, on the fore dune, which is the top of the dunes, also exposed to wind, but a little bit less of the salty water from the sea. And it grows in the hind dunes, where it is hidden from the wind and from the salty water of the sea. So the researchers that were studying this plant did a very nice experiment where they had populations of different densities at different locations along the coast. So they had low densities and high densities at the seafront, at the top of the dune, and behind the dune. And they measured plant performance, which was uh, measured here as survival. And this is the function of plant survival in response of density. So you see each of these dots corresponds to a different population densities. The ones on the left of the plot are the lowest densities and the ones on the right are the highest densities. And first of all, you can see that the environment has an effect of competition, as we just said. The plants that grow behind the dune, protected from everything, do have a decline in survival when the population density increases. So this is decline of performance when population density increases, so potentially proof of competition. Whereas the populations in the middle and the seaward do not have their survival affected by plant density. So no big deal, we can say that in this environment here, in the high dunes, competition strongly affects survival. And if the researchers stopped only at this trait, this would be the conclusion of their experiment. But they were very thorough, and they also measured fecundity. Uh, this is the, probably the number of seeds that the plant produced. And you can see here that fecundity, although it is not very visible, but there is a significant negative interaction between fecundity and density in the high dunes. Yes? I don't know what is fecundity. It is reproductive success. It can be number of seeds, it can be number of flowers, anything that the kind of like fertility. Does that make sense? Okay, so fertility, number of seeds, let's say number of seeds. Number of seeds declines uh, when you're behind the dune, but also strongly declines when you're in front of the dune. So in here, they measured two different traits and they show two different results. Competition is dependent not only on the environment, but it is also dependent on the trait which is measured. So things are getting more and more complicated, and I think I have one last level of complication, uh, 
which is kind of connected to, I'm sorry, which is kind of connected to these two, we see that competition is not the same depending on the life stage. So survival was measured very early for the small plants and fertility obviously can only be measured for the adult plants. So different life stages have different competition intensities in different environments. And this leads me to the next point that competition is dependent on the plant life cycle. It has been theorized in the, that in the seedlings, in the smallest plants, there is mostly competition for space. The plants are trying to grow as much as possible, take as much space as possible. So when they're small, they're mostly competing for space because this is the limiting factor, as we saw in the pots of Centrorium erythrae. Then when the plants reach uh, larger sizes, they start competing for nutrients because they're trying to produce even more leaves, they're trying to reach a vegetative stage, and all of this requires a lot of energy, a lot of nutrients required for the plant to grow. And finally, when they're in their larger stages, they're mostly competing for light because they're big enough to have all the space they need. The roots likely go deep enough to have all the nutrients they need, but they can always be overshadowed by an even taller plant that is nearby. So, with all this in mind, uh, I usually don't like text slides, but this might be good information if you're ever designing an experiment for a competition. Here are several guidelines about how to design a good competition experiment. So, first of all, you need to assume that there is a relationship between the population density and the competition intensity. All of the experiments that I have showed you, they implicitly assume this relationship. But you need to be aware that unless if you prove what is connecting population density and population performance, you cannot say with 100% certainty that there is competition. So for this, in order to be sure that the plants are actually competing when growing nearby, you have to identify the limiting resource for which the species are competing. Is it nutrients? Is it sunlight? Is it maybe access to pollinators? And so on. Then uh, you need to simulate realistic plant densities. We saw that if they're too low, you might not see competition. If they're too high, it doesn't have any biological sense. Uh, and you need to control for the variation in the environment. You need to be aware that not, none of these invalidates your experiment if you don't do it, but you need to be aware that there are some limitations of the conclusions you can make. And finally, whenever possible, try to measure as many performance traits as possible because different traits can respond to competition differently. Now, if you want to have an excellent experiment of competition, you have to do all of these good practices, but ideally you would also test for multiple population densities. As we saw in the seagrass experiment, they had a lot of different densities in their plots. Uh, and you need to repeat your experiment in multiple environments. And this, we also saw it in the previous example. Uh, so they, that was how do we study competition? Do you have any questions about that? Unless if you're making a competition experiment in the next few months, probably it's not the most urgent. But if you ever do, come and see me. I'll be happy to answer your questions. So, this, uh, the next part is about how, and I think this is the last part, I don't know why it's number two. Anyways, uh, lastly we're going to see the different ways to classify competition and to study it. We already saw that interactions can be classified in different ways, intraspecific, interspecific, positive, negative, mutually beneficial, parasitic, and so on. Competition is an interaction and we can also classify it in several different ways. These classifications are made by people that study competition to make their life easier, but please bear in mind that they are made to make things easier. They're not necessarily always true for all types of competition. Sometimes two different classes can co-occur together in the same interaction. You will, we will see several examples about this. So the first one is classifying competition as uh, exploitative or interference competition. 
So exploitative competition, we talked about it quite a lot so far. It happens when two individuals are competing for the same resources and one individual is better at exploiting the resource compared to the other. So the individual would exploit the resource better, will grow bigger, and the other one will grow smaller or maybe even die out. Interference competition, on the other hand, occurs when one species is actively blocking the growth of another, but not through resource exploitation. So typically, an example about interference competition is what we call allelopathy. Uh, I will spell this out in the course notes for you afterwards. It's when one plant is producing toxic compounds that are inhibiting the growth or are even killing the others. Uh, interference competition comes from animal interactions, where you have a lot of confrontation between individuals. One individual is defending its territory, so not allowing the other to access the resources. But it can also happen in plants. Plants can defend their territory, for instance, by producing toxic compounds. Uh, and an example about this uh, is what happens in the pine forests, which are very abundant in the Beskidi. Uh, this is a photo that I took uh, hiking in the Beskidi. I even remember the peak last, last week, but never mind. Uh, the Beskidi is a forest with a lot of pine trees, which is good for the economy because they grow fast and they produce a lot, lot of woods. Not so good because they're not ideally suited for growing in these mountains, but also because they are at very high densities and the pine needles are toxic. They're toxic for all other types of vegetation except for pine. So when you see the soil here that is completely devoid of any other type of vegetation, it is partly because the pines are very large and they cast a lot of shadow, so not enough plants can grow underneath. But they're not even mosses. They're not even these small plants that are usually used to growing without sunlight. And this is because the soil is covered in plant poison, which prevents them from growing. So the pines are exerting this very strong interference competition, not allowing anything else. Uh -huh. This is another example about interference competition that I like very much. It's two vines competing for space. Now look at the moment the one on the left uh, hooks onto the support, how the one on the right just goes bloop, like completely disappointed in life it lost the race. Again, here is the one on the left, it's coming, it's attaching to it, and the one on the right just kind of drops down. So when the vines are growing, they have these uh, sensitive cells in their meristem on the top of the on the top of the, the the stem, and they're growing in this. They have this kind of circular motion. This is obviously accelerated. It doesn't happen as fast in real life, and they're growing in these circular motion patterns, trying to look for support. And both of these are sensing that there is some support nearby because both of them are kind of inclining in the same direction as they grow. But the moment the one on the left hooks onto the support, uh, I don't know the exact mechanism, but one on the right senses that and kind of goes, well, if I try to hook on the same support, then I will be in direct competition for growth and maybe even for space and for sunlight with this one. So I'm just going to go and look something else otherwise. So this is a typical example of interference competition, as we can see it in animals, where one of the plants is kind of defending its territory and the other one is just going to look for its resources elsewhere. I just, I mean, it's a very simple example. I don't know the details of the, the, the actual biological interactions, but I find it very funny to look at. Once again, here it is, go, and you see the one on the right just going, I'm done here. This uh, is a different type of interference competition uh, where the plant is recruiting soldiers to do its dirty work. Uh, it's also a very fascinating example that I would like to share with you, but someone explains it better than I do. So, we saw how we have kind of an interference competition between the cercopia tree, which is this one here, and anything that might grow around it. But this time the tree is not producing any toxins, but instead it's recruiting ants and providing a lot of services for the ants to uh, fight off other competitors, such as these vines that were trying to crawl up the tree. 
Another funny anecdote that I found searching about this tree was that in some places it is called the novice tree because everybody knows that under no circumstances you should stand under or even worse touch this kind of tree. And the thing is, uh, well the locals know about this, this because this tree is so highly competitive usually it is the only one to grow in the middle of the clearance because all other surrounding vegetation has been eliminated. So when novice, inexperienced people come, they're like, oh, here is a tree. Let's have a break underneath the tree. And then the plants are coming to attack them, which is apparently not very pleasant because they're uh, these kind of fire ants that uh, sting very, very badly. Uh, so I think this is exploitation versus interference competition. Let's see another way. We can skip this one another way to classify competition and this time it will be by interactions within species that is called intraspecific competition or between species which is called interspecific competition so here you have an example where this plant androsaceae septentrionalis was grown at different densities and this is a very small plant and you can see that they grew from 300 plants per square meter up to 3,000. That is like really, really, really dense population. And they counted plant performance as the number of fruits per primary stem. So it can make several different stems, but they only counted the, the main one, which is usually the biggest one. And you can clearly see this lovely curve of interspecific competition how the plant performance decreases in a non-linear way as plant density increases. And this only happens between plants of the same species that are grown together. But I don't even need to show you experiments like this. I mean, any gardener knows what happens if you don't remove your carrots or your radishes when you're growing them. If they grow too close together, there is competition for resources, and then you don't get the juicy roots of radishes that you are aiming for. Uh, here is an example about interspecific competition, so between two different species. And there are two species growing in the Arizona desert in the US. Uh, so one is a kind of a bushy tree, and the other one is a herbaceous bush. So the experiment had four treatments that were conducted in the desert. They were done for each of the two species, but I'm going to focus on the tree only. So one treatment was without any competition at all. So in a given perimeter, they removed all surrounding vegetation. The other one was intraspecific competition only. So they removed the ambrosia bushes, but they didn't remove the trees that were nearby. The other is interspecific competition. So all the trees were removed around the focal tree of the study but the bushes were left. And lastly, we have the two types of competition, intra and interspecific, which are combined together. So here we don't study a type of competition, but we study the intensity of competition. And here you are the, the results. So here they measured water potential of the plants. Uh, just a quick break, because I said performance is usually measured through traits that give, tell us how fast the plant is growing, how good it is at reproducing and so on. Water potential only shows how good the plant is at getting water from the soil. But these are desert plants. If they cannot get water from the soil, they cannot grow. So in desert plants, even though this is not a direct growth or performance trait, water potential is a very good estimate of the plant performance. If you can't get enough water, you are not going to grow. And here are the results. So plants growing without competition were obviously the most performant, but plants growing with intraspecific competition, they didn't really interfere with each other's performance. It is only when you add the interspecific competition, so these bush-like trees growing with the herbaceous bushes that you see the effects of interspecific competition. The only type of competition occurring in this ecosystem, in this study, is interspecific competition. Uh, and uh, this should have also been a little bit before, but sibling competition is a type of 
intraspecific competition, so within species, between siblings, between, well, brothers and sisters that we might call them. This is the example that I have already shown you beforehand. Here we have a typical sibling competition between individuals that were produced from the same mother plant, and all of the seeds are brothers, or at least half brothers and sisters. And it has been argued that sibling competition is what drives uh, the evolution, for instance, of dispersal strategies. Because if all the seeds of a plant, they fall exactly at the feet of the plant, they will compete with each other for resources. They will also compete with their mother plant for the resources, which is not ideal. So instead, some plants have evolved these dispersal strategies that allow for the seeds to be sent as far away as possible in order for them to avoid sibling competition. Now, obviously, no strategy, strategy is ideal, and seeds that are dispersing far away have other risks. They can be in competition with other species. They can even fall into an environment that is completely unfavorable for their germination. But it's simply a risk that these species have undertaken. I don't know if you can really tell it from the photo here, but the one underneath corresponds to fruits that are dispersed by animals. They have the little hooks that, uh, that grasp the, the fur of passing animals and they disperse by animals. Yet another way to classify competition is by its symmetry and intensity. We saw this at the very beginning of the lecture. Two plants can have the same, can exert the same intensity of competition to one another because the two have the same capability of exploiting the resources. This problem is that the two plants are very similar to one another, either by their physiological requirements, because you know there are different plant species that have that require the, the same resources, or as we previously saw, because they are also genetically similar, as is the case between siblings. So here we have an example of symmetrical competition, where the intensity of competition from one plant to the other is exactly the same. And then you can obviously have asymmetrical competition or symmetrical competition between seedlings. Asymmetrical competition that occurs when one plant is much better at exploiting the resources than the other. In this case, the competition is asymmetrical and the intensity of the competition is higher when the bigger competitor is competing with the smaller one than when the smaller one is competing with the bigger one. We can, depending on which of the plants we study here, we can say that the, is the plant, this one is exerting very strong competition and this one is exerting very low competition. And yet another example about asymmetrical competition is what occurs between big trees and all the small seedlings that are supposed to grow under the trees, but they're clearly not because the competition is too strong. So here is an example about competition intensity in a marsh. So marsh is this kind of swamp water body with a lot of water, not enough oxygen in the soil. And if it is a salty marsh, it can also have salts and other kinds of uh, toxic compounds in the water. There were three grass species that were studied, a chorus, carex, and tifa. And the experimental design was very simple. On one hand, they were the plants that were grown in the swamp without the vegetation being modified. And on the other hand, there were patches where all vegetation except the focal species, I have symbolized them with different shapes, has been removed. Uh, and they measured a, something called relative competitive intensity. Uh, this is a way to measure plant performance by comparing the difference between performance of the cleared plants and the uncleared plants. It's exactly what we saw at the beginning of the lecture. So if the cleared plants are much big, bigger than the uncleared ones, we have a positive number and we have competition. And in order to be able to compare among plants of different sizes, we simply standardize this value by the cleared plant, by the, the, the performance of the cleared plants. So relative competitive intensity is a very neat measure. It is a number between zero and one. If relative competitive intensity is zero, it means that there is no competition. 
because the performance of the plants in the cleared space and in the densely colonized space is the same. So the difference of these two numbers is zero. Zero divided by anything still remains zero. Whereas if relative competitive intensity is close to one, then we have competitive exclusion. This means that the performance of the individuals growing by themselves is 100% better than the performance of individuals growing with competition. And here are the results. We have the two species on the top, the acorus and the carex, that have kind of the same relative competitive intensity at around 40%, and Tifa langustifolia that has a much worse relative much yeah that suffers much more from competition because its relative competitive intensity is higher. So these two have similar competitive abilities, have, uh, have symmetrical effects on one another, whereas this one is suffering much more from the competition. Which species is the best competitor? Yeah, probably. I mean, I think the difference between these two is not significant, so we kind of have Calanus and Cretina that are kind of the same. Come on. So which of these interactions should be the most symmetrical? When you have intraspecific competition, so individuals that are from the same species with the same ecological requirements, Interspecific competition among closely related species. So there are different species, but they kind of have the same ecological requirements. Or interspecific competition among distantly related species that probably require different resources for their growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the more similar are the species to one another, the more symmetrical is going to be the competition because they have the same faculties. So intraspecific, when you have two individuals of the same species, they do have genetic differences between them if they're not clones, but the competition should be quite symmetrical. And then which of the same interactions is the most intense? Intraspecific? Inter? Mm, this is a kind of a tricky question, but thank you for answering it. <laughs> uh, we can we can say that if two species are competing for exactly the same resource, or two individuals are competing for exactly the same resource, the competition is going to be the most intense, because they both want exactly the same thing. Whereas if they are competing for kind of the same things, but not exactly, the competition is not going to be so intense. But on the other hand, you can also say that interspecific competition is asymmetrical, so you can have high intensity of competition from one individual, and not from the other. So your answer is not wrong. It depends on how you define the competition intensity and symmetry. Um, yeah, and this is yet another round of what I was just saying. It is assumed that competition intensity increases as the genetic difference between two individuals decrease. So the competition should be the highest between clones that are, well, two individuals with exactly the same genotype. And then as we go further down in the genetic differentiation, it becomes weaker. So it's a little bit less intense between self-siblings, individuals that are produced by self-pollination. So they have not only the same mother and the same father, but it is the same plant. Then um, this should be inversed. Half siblings goes on top because they share one parent, but not the other. Full siblings means that, no, no, it's right. Full siblings means that they share the two parents and half siblings means that they share only one parent, so they're less and less related. And competition intensity should also decrease between population ecotypes, so individuals of the same population, but they might have different ecological requirements. Between cultivars, variety and races, so these are populations of the same species, but that have evolved separately for some amount of time. And obviously, competition intensity should be the lowest between different species. Now, this is the view on competition intensity from a genetic difference point of view. But sometimes, as we saw with the competition in the marsh, with the plants competing in the watery habitats, uh, plants can be of different species and still have the same requirements. 
they still need the same space to grow, the same nutrients, and so on. So another, uh, another way of how com to view how competition intensity decreases is depending on the physiological and ecological requirements of the plants. In the case of Acarus calamus and Carex crinita, even though they were two different species, because they have the same requirements for resources, the competition was quite symmetrical and quite intense among the two species. Then we have a species in which one is a very good competitor and the other really is not. So we still have intense competition, but it only goes one way. The other species doesn't really exert any competitive pressure. And this usually ends in what we call competitive exclusion. One of the species is, is excluded from the habitat. We will see this in quite a lot of detail in the third lecture of competition. It is the case of Lamium amplexicoli, which is not competitive at all. The moment other plants start to invade its habitat, it simply disappears. And any grass that might invade Lamium's habitat, such as Mistucarubia. So the Lamium amplexicoli grows in abundance in early spring, after the soil has been tilled, like after all the vegetation has been removed. And then as the spring advances and other plants start to grow in the soil, the populations of Lamium amplexicoli simply disappear and they do not regrow until the next season of tilling. And then we can, there is this very interesting view of how when two species are so different that they require completely different resources, even if they grow one next to the other, there is no competition between them. We have what we call niche differentiation. So niche can be broadly defined as all the requirements an individual has to grow. So the, how much water, how much light, what types of nutrients, what kind of pollinators and so on. And this is an example of two species. The bush with the flowers here is Impatiens maculata. And there are a lot of trees that I don't know what's their name. Uh, and you would think that Impatiens maculata grows on the forest floor. So it has a lot of shadow on it. So it should be competing for light. But it's actually a species that has evolved to have minimal light requirements so it can grow on the floor of the forests without being disturbed at all by all the species that are towering above it. So any other species that might have similar light requirements as these trees would be in competition, highly asymmetrical competition for light with the trees, but there is no competition, at least as far as light goes, between impatience maculata and the trees that are towering, because they simply don't require the same type of light habitat. Uh, and I think this is the last concept about how can we classify competition. I always need to think about it. Competitive effect and competitive ability. This is why I have given the definitions here. So competitive effect is the damage that one individual can do to the other. And competitive ability is the capacity of an individual to withstand this competition, to continue to grow even if it is facing competition. So here we have a species that has, well, a plant that has very low competitive ability because when it grows in the shadow on the left here, it is much smaller than when it grows without shadow. So for now, this is shadow. We don't know who is making the shadow, but we see that when it's competing for light, this species tends to grow very small. So its competitive ability when it comes to light is very low. And what is interesting is that in quite a lot of plants, especially in the seedling stage, it really doesn't matter what kind of species is casting the shadow, what kind of tree or even a bush is casting the shadow, it will always have the same effect on the growth of the species. So I've shown you several different trees that have the same competitive effect on this small seedling that has very low competitive ability to tolerate shadow. And here we have another species whose competitive ability in the shadow is much higher because as you can see, its performance doesn't change whether it grows in the shadow or in the light. 
So the seedling on the right of each of the experimental uh, plots has high competitive ability because it supports shadow as well as sunlight, whereas the seedling on the left has low competitive ability. Here is an example about a, uh, I think this is an invasive species in the Czech Republic, I'm not sure, the Lithium salicaria, uh, which, whose, but the reduction in biomass, so by how much it growth is, it growth is stunted, has been measured as a function of the biomass of different competitors. And what you can see here is that when lithium is competing with small plants, such as, such as ranunculus reptans, it has a high competitive ability. As you can see, its biomass reduction here is very low. So with or without competition, when you grow these two plants together, lithium is always going to be very big. Whereas, when you grow lithium salicaria with plants that are much bigger, such as Tifalatifolia here, the biomass reduction is like over 95%. So when lithium salicaria faces competition by Tifalatifolia, its competitive ability is very, very low. So once again, competitive ability, competitive effect is not an absolute value. It is something that depends on the plants that are competing with each other. And I think this is the last type of classifying competition that we're going to see today. It is what we call apparent competition. It is when uh, we observe a decline in the performance of individuals as density increases, which we already saw, but this declining performance is not due to competition for resources or to interference, but it is due to some other interaction that we didn't measure. So I've, known, I've mentioned this in the, in the introduction. Sometimes plants can grow at high densities, but they're not competing for resources because the resources are very abundant. But instead at high densities, all kinds of pathogens and parasites can be easily transmitted from one plant to another. So in this case, it is not actually competition that reduces the performance of the plant, but it is the disease that is spreading much easier in the dense population than in the less dense population. Think about the importance of staying at home when there is a global pandemic so that we avoid spreading the virus among us. Um, so this, some people say that this is still competition because we still have the negative relationship between performance and density. It doesn't matter if it is because of uh, fighting for resources or because of better or worse resistance to pathogens. Um, yeah, I'm showing you exactly the same example. So we have um, herbivores that are spreading much easily in populations that are more, like, more diverse than in a population where there is only one species at lower densities. Um, but the problem, like I personally have a problem with saying that this is not competition, this is only apparent or fake competition. And for this I have this example of the mycorrhizal interactions with the roots. So rhizospheres are these kind of organism assemblies that we find in the soil, which contain at least the roots of the plant which are the orange fingers that we see here, and microscopic organisms, mostly mycorrhiza, that are these uh, string-like mushrooms, fungi, that have this symbiotic association with the mycorrhiza. We now know that all plants have mycorrhiza. There are very few, if any, exceptions of plants that don't have mycorrhiza. And these fungi help not only to increase the absorbent surface of the roots, but they also break down nutrients in the soil and make them easier to absorb by the plants. So when two plants are competing for the same resources, one can get more resource because it has bigger roots. But also, one plant can get more resources because it has better mycorrhizal associations. Uh, yeah, you can't really see the orange on the brown, but you, you, you saw the small orange lines going around. So these two plants, can have exactly the same genotypes, exactly the same requirements and resources, but if this one has better mycorrhizal fungus associations, it will still grow bigger than the other one. So, in this case, bigger, 
Come on, no, well, I'm missing half of the animation. So in this case, are we talking about competition or apparent competition? Because it is not the two plants interacting with each other, it is the two plants interacting with the intermediary of the mycorrhizal fungi. Come on, I think this is missing a pill. Um, there we go. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I simply find it fascinating. I'll be very happy to discuss it if, for instance, if you find other examples of debatable discussions, where is it competition, is it not competition, uh, in the future, if you feel like it. Okay, so I'm done talking for today. Here are the conclusions of today's lecture. Again, a little bullet point summary in case you need this for revisions in the future or whatever. So competition is something, a biological interaction, that occurs among two species which have, to some extent, similar resource requirements. They should at least share one resource, even if it is just the space in which they're growing for the competition to occur. To measure the competition, we need to compare the performance of individuals growing with and without competition in low and high densities. We need to know what the plants are competing for. Is it nutrients? Is it sunlight? Uh, is it mycorrhizal fungi associations? And so on. And we need to control for anything else that might influence our competition experiment. So variation in the environment, indirect interactions with mycorrhizal fungi pathogens, and the life cycle, uh, the life cycle traits. If we measure competition in young plants and in old plants, we might not get the same results. And several, we saw several ways to describe competition. So we can ask whether competition is done uh, by exclusion or by interference among organisms, whether it is intra or interspecific, how symmetrical and how intense it is, what is the competitive effect, so the ability to prevent other species from growing, and the competitive ability, that is the capacity to fight against competition, and whether the competition is apparent or whether it is the competition between two individuals. Any questions? <laughs>